um, Church for All Nations. And so there's a lot of administrative things that I do for myself here as we're in transition and we're doing the things that need to get done. Chris will tell you, and thank God for Maddie and all of her Apple computer expertise, uh, there's things I'm learning along the way, and I'm appreciating that. In the same way, whenever we're in transition, there's always growing pains. Just because I'm short, yes, I never went through growing pains like some of you, but the reality is there are growing pains in the reality of ministry. And something I'm going to do is kind of fireside chats without the fire because it's hot enough out here as it is. At 82 degrees today, it was a relief. You know what I'm saying? It was a, it's actually got up to 86, but it was a relief. And what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to have different times where Marge and I, whether it's in our home, sometimes in the office during the day, and as change happens, you have questions. You have questions. I I'm not going to promise to always have answers, and I'm not going to promise that your concerns will always dictate a change because I have to look at the best interests of the body. But I am not here to be aloof. In a given week, um, I should probably let some of you job shadow uh, me, but it's not uncommon for me to have an 80-hour work week. I've actually been breaking or violating the Sabbath, the Shabbat, in that very seldom do I take a Friday off and I need to. Marge and I need that time, and it is important. But in the course of this next week, I think I've got something every single night. And so in serving you and ministering, and how many of you know, do you have any idea how many hours it takes? Um, I'm preaching in the course of a week three different, completely different messages. That is more than I did back at Church for All Nations. Okay, that's three different messages. And, and, and uh, Ron, you know what that takes. You know the research, the study, and really hearing from the Lord. And so in the midst of it, when you have concerns and you want to get together, I want to hear from you. The last thing, and I would have done this different at Church for All Nations, we sometimes never know a person's concern until we see their empty seat and we know that they've been hurt or they've been wounded. And so what's important is not that we always agree, but we agree to come together. And the Bible says, let us come together. I don't know if you really have a sense, but the reason I think I've stayed somewhat young and somewhat healthy is because I'm open to a discussion. Somebody once said, well, pastor, I don't feel I can come and talk to you. You're a Jew. And as a result of that, you're like a lawyer and you're going to out debate me or you're too intelligent. I can't promise to become ignorant or dumb in order to have a conversation, but I'm not a condescending person. I'm not a judgmental person. My heart is genuinely to know my sheep. I believe a shepherd must smell like a sheep. But I also believe every time the Lord brings a new pastor, that pastor is gonna be different than any pastor you've had before. There will come a day the Lord will call me. I mean, that's just the law of the seed. That's just how it goes. And I will be, the next pastor will be completely different. The real heart is that I'm in love with Jesus Christ. The real heart is I'm here to serve you. But along the way, let's remember this. We say we've been together for a year, but officially it's been December 2nd. I was pastoring two churches simultaneously on many levels. I don't want to say since July, but you know, Chris, there were a couple out of two weeks and 18, 19 days at a time in July, August, September, October, and November. So, I mean, you know, we've been getting to know each other for a while, but it's really been officially seven, not even seven months. Yeah, well, yeah, seven months, seven months. And so, how many of you are grateful for what the Lord is doing? How many of you are genuinely grateful for what he is doing? And there's a lot of new folks that are being onboarded along the way. And there's a lot of children we're beginning to reach as well. But friends, it's also important you know, uh, and Marge will tell you, uh, my heart, my heart is never to be insensitive or tone deaf to where you're at. Today when I was backing out of my driveway, I don't generally make calls, and I don't generally do this on a Sunday, but when I realize there's people that want to talk, and this is like, guys, we're not having some major crisis. I'm gonna, how many of you know the Bill Wolfson you see on the platform is who you see if you come to my home? It'll be the same thing. Doug, Noemi, when we're together, uh, I think it's this Tuesday night at 4 p.m., um, it'll be the same Bill Wolfson. That's one thing you'll always see. I can't, I just learned I'm just not a good Oral Roberts. I'm not a good Benny Hinn. Bless you. I just don't have that gifting. I have to be me. I'm not T.D. Jakes. I'm just going to be Bill Wolfson. 
But along the way, when you have questions, you have ideas, you have concerns, a lot of folks say, well, Pastor, you don't get together with me. Well, maybe um, you don't, haven't asked. And friends, as discerning as I want to be, when things are happening in your life, I want to be there, but also understand there are times it's gonna take a month. At Church for All Nations, it sometimes took four months, but we had a lot of other staff members as well. And so please, please, please realize um, people, when they get to be my age, they often retire. Here, I genuinely believe I'm on the most important assignment that I've ever had in my life. This is a complicated ministry. This is a complicated city. I love a challenge. I love a challenge. But friends, we need revival. We need revival. Our children need to wake up and put off their slumber. We need revival. So please be aware. A lot of times you may call and you may feel it's an emergency and I'll say, Marge will meet with you. She has her master's in counseling. And you'll say, well, I want to see pastor. My number one role here, friends, is not, past, is not, um, is, is not counseling you. It is first to be the visionary for this church and the direction we're moving. Number two, the oracle, to bring you the word. And does anybody remember what the third thing is if you went through Connect with HCA? Huh? Oh, I am here to definitely disciple you guys. I am here to make sure as a vision caster that we stay on track with the vision. So I want to encourage you as far as that's concerned, but your concerns are important to me. Now, Pastor, are you getting phone call after phone call? No. I'm aware after pastoring for 40 years, it's kind of like a marriage. A lot of times you don't know your marriage is falling apart, and then all of a sudden your mate tells you they want a divorce, and a lot of times, guys especially, you thought she was happy. Or maybe you figured, if she's not, why should I worry about it? She's not going anywhere. And all of a sudden, it's over because we fail to communicate. So just wanted you to be aware of that, and I am bringing it out there so you're aware. Um, I will always make myself available, but sometimes you have to be flexible. I find that I'm the most alert at 1 a.m., till 2.30 a.m. How many of you, that's when you just, mar that's, don't play Marge at 1 a.m. I didn't want to bring this up. I, oh, there you are, Steve. I didn't want to bring up your, um, your beat down. But Marge and Steve played ping pong till the wee hours of the morning here recently. And, uh, but I want you to know, Steve says, okay, dude, do a Paul Harvey. What about the rest of the story? Marge is a great ping pong player, isn't she? Then Steve toyed with me. Do we play one game only? One too many. And he killed me. He beat me. And so uh, and I, next time I play you, I'm going to play with my eyes open. I'm going to change a little bit. It wasn't like that at all. But wasn't that fun? Wasn't that fun? Music ministry, we had a great time. So I'm at a funeral. I don't mean now. I was at a funeral, and a professor whose name will not be mentioned from Bible college uh, this was an important funeral. This was a high-profile person in the community. This is a person who attended our church years ago, and now the person was a pastor who went to be with the Lord. You know this pastor, Steve. And all of a sudden, it's time for the funeral. It's time for the funeral! Dum, dum, da, dum, dum, dum. I mean, it's all there. It is well. How many of you know the songs are going to play at funerals? You know, it is well with my soul and amazing grace. Great is thy faithfulness. And my friend, the pastor, who at this point would have been about 87 years old, give or take a day, was nowhere to be found. Now, I've done many weddings. I've done many funerals. How many of you know um, this is not a good thing? Now, I know he could have thought, well, hey, it's not like the corpse is going anywhere, you know. But, you know but, and they're calling him, and he's not answering his cell phone. They can't find him. I mean, here's a funeral. The place was at Joe Finley's church. The place was jam-packed, and the pastor wasn't there. And I'm thinking, don't ask me. I don't even know the guy. And I've had no time to prepare. And my senior's pastor, uh, Pastor Raymond Wirch, who, uh, boy, he was with me from 1993 all the way to when we left. He's in his late 80s, and he's still the senior's pastor. It's called Torchbearers um, for the group. Do you know Ray Wirch? 
You know him when he was Montevideo, Minnesota. Of course you do. And uh, he was there, and I looked at him. Pastor, what do we do? What do we do? He says, don't worry about it. That's why you hired me. I'm a seniors pastor. I'm a professional when it comes to doing funerals. And he got up there, and he did the funeral as if he was the guy who was supposed to do it. The problem with the other pastor who I called later on that day, dude, where were you? He said, well, what do you mean? I said, you were supposed to do a funeral this morning at 11 a.m. He went, no, 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 that's this Friday. No, I said, it's Wednesday, it's today, you were supposed to do it. He says, Pastor Wolfson, I'm pa And he looked at his calendar. I wrote the wrong date down. How many of you know his timing was off? How many of you, your timing has ever been off? If you're a musician, would you raise your hand? How many of you have ever had your timing off? Or worse, how many of you have ever had somebody else in the band have their timing off, and then, okay, Maddie, and then they throw, it was somebody else, not you. Of course, I knew that. But anyway, did you know that empowered people, take a look, know the times. In fact, let me give you a great investment. On September 10th, 2001, you want to, how many of you like to be Marty McFly and Back to the Future? How many of you like to be able to go back and make your investments based on already knowing that Muhammad Ali beat George Foreman? Knowing that the Seattle Seahawks, when they won the Super Bowl a few years ago, or 1985 when the Chicago Bears won and all that kind of stuff? Well, guess what, friends? If you would have bought a few pounds of gold on September 10th, 2001, especially if you would have bought it on margin, never even took delivery of the gold, you would have become a very wealthy person. All you had to know that there were going to be suicide bombers that were going to fly into the World Trade Center and all that was going to take place and the difficulties with the stock market and also the commodities market afterwards. We're living in a time frame today like never before where we must know the times that we are living in. A lot of us are still trying to live as if, as if we're in the 1950s. A lot of us, how many of you know, how many of you remember the time, how many of you lived in a community or you remember a day, maybe here in Hemet, where you didn't have to lock your house or your car doors? How many of you remember that? How many of you know what they call that now? A sitting duck. A sitting duck. Not a good thing to do. We're living in a day where jets have been transformed into weapons of mass destruction. Who would have ever thunk? Who would have ever known the things that we've seen? Our postal system through the years has become a delivery system for death and destruction with Ryzen and with anthrax and all the other things. The word Islam today, and I am not against people, but you have to hear what I'm saying, because friends, this is a biblical concept that the Bible talks about 3,500 years ago. So if you leave today and say, Bill's a hater, I just love the word. I'm gonna preach the word. Friends, how many of you have ever heard me say that Judaism today has become a dead religious system? And for the most part, it really has. And even though I'm a Jew, and I'm grateful for my upbringing, I still realize that, friends, Jesus Christ is the truth, the way, and the life. But the word Islam is being sanitized, and it's being perceived in a way that is contrary to Scripture. Recently, there's been questions because of visas that were rejected by the Knesset, by the Israeli government and immigration. There's a lot of questions about, you know, uh, are we racist or are we, you know, are we into ethnic cleansing or what's wrong with us? In fact, we're afraid to say that there are certain belief systems that are godless. How many of you would agree that the Ku Klux Klan, which is dedicated to what they call ethnic and racial purity, how many of you would agree a group that is anti-Semitic, anti-Jewish, anti-black, really anything that's, anything that's not Anglo-Saxon, how many of you would say that's an evil thing? How many of you agree with me? 
So you can say, well, wait a minute. But I want to be very clear, friends, when you go back to the history of the Blackstone Rangers and the Black Panthers, and you look at the Bloods, and you look at the Crips, and you look at different gangs, friends, we're not talking about a certain race of people. We're speaking of a spirit of terrorism, and it's important we call it out. But as Christians... As believers, we have to go back to the Spanish Inquisition. We have to go back to the Crusades. We have to go back to Martin Luther, who was a Jew hater. Read his book, Those Filthy Lying um, Jews. And he deals with this whole situation. Maybe you didn't know this. And I'm not here to put people down, but we have to recognize that more people were told by Dr. Doug Cotton, were told that more people have been killed in the name of religion than heart attacks cancer and auto accidents combined in the name of religion. So we want to understand terrorism, you can find it even under the banner of so-called Christianity, if you will. You see, friends, Americans are willing to give up freedoms that 18 years ago on September 10th, they would have died for. How many of you have been on an airplane within the last 18 years? How many of you know the whole spirit in the airport is completely different? The things we're willing to tolerate, the things we're willing to put up with, but friends, it's a trade-off, and it's all because of four airplanes and going back to the World Trade Center and going back to the Pentagon and going back to a field that was also possibly uh, designated to hit the Pentagon as well. The skyline of our nation's largest state was altered in a moment's time 18 years ago. How many of you have ever been in the World Trade Center? Come on now. If you've been there in the last five years, I want to let you know you weren't. But you know something? When you go to New York, even now, it's different. It's not the same. People who didn't own an American flag prior to 9-11 were singing America the Beautiful at sports events. I mean, how many remember after 9-11, it was so weird to see Newt Gingrich standing next to Hillary Clinton and the Republicans and Pelosi standing next to um, um, a, a, a strong Thurman and just looking at these different individuals and seeing them praise and, and, and our country and sing together in, in synchrony, in unity, in harmony. Then years later, there were professional athletes who refused to stand for the national anthem. Now, before you get freaked out, let's try to understand their hurt. Just for a moment, understand their pain. Let's try to understand. I completely disagree with their decision, but how many of you know we still want to bring them to Jesus? We want them to know Jesus. And we could be so busy looking at Kaepernick and everybody else, and we could be so judgmental, but the nature of, of, of our culture, of the civilization we live in, it has been altered in the same way the landscape of New York has been altered, if you will. We're fighting a new kind of war that we cannot clarify, that we cannot define. In 1972 in Munich, Germany, when the Israeli athletes were killed by the Palestinian Liberation Organization, I mean, under Anwar Sadat, we looked at that and we just said, uh, Arafat rather, we just said, I can't believe this. Who does this? How can this happen? And all of a sudden, that was a defining moment in our culture. A new kind of war. But yet the scripture says, empowered people know the times. Now, don't answer me. Don't give me a gratuitous amen. But do you really know the times you're living in? How many of you know some of us bought a home before the recession, and those who bought a home after the recession said, I said a happy, happy day. Oh, happy day. Those of us who bought a home Right before the recession, when the real estate prices were at the peak, whole different story. Imagine if you could know the times we're living in. Imagine if you could know the next five years. Imagine if you could really know where our culture is coming from. Many of us misunderstand when the scripture says no man knows the time of the return of Christ, only the Father who's in heaven. We don't realize it was speaking of a unique 
festival as far as the return of Christ, and I won't tell you which one, but there's only one of the seven Jewish holidays, or the Moedim as they're called, where because of when the new moon takes place, you don't know if it's gonna be this day or that day. It was a 24 hour period. And so when Jesus said, no man knows the time, only my father who's in heaven, he was talking about the return, he was saying, you can still kind of see some of the earmarks. We can still pinpoint some of the signs and wonders. Matthew 24 talks about the importance of looking to the sky. Daniel chapter nine, well actually seven, eight, and nine, gives us some real insights. There's a lot, but that's not exactly where this series is gonna go. Empower people know the time. Listen to this, if you bought Microsoft a few, a few years ago when they first went public, do you know how much you'd be worth today? You'd be, a, if you just put $5,000 in, you would be a multi, multi-millionaire. If you bought Microsoft for $5,000 in 2010, you would have lost 35% of your value. Timing is everything. How many of you have stayed away from the stock market? Come on, how many of you just stayed away because you just said, I'm bad at it. I don't know. I have friends that are called day traders. They'll buy the same, they'll buy stocks in a given day and they look for just little algorithms and little changes. Uh, what you call them is uh, bankrupt. But anyway, empowered people know the times. And there are things that, where Jesus said, you can know the times. He talked to the children of Israel. And he said, guys, in the Garden of Eden, I promised you a Messiah. I promised you that the line of Judah would come. I promised you the scepter would not depart out of Judah. I promised that even though on the day of the, you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall surely die, I'm going to die for you, that I'm going to literally create blood covenant with you. I mean, it's such an amazing thing. And he, and, and, and he said, Jesus wept over Jerusalem. Shortest scripture in all the Bible, Jesus wept. But what caused him to weep? He wept over the fact that people didn't know the times. They didn't know the seasons. Many of us miss our divine opportunity. How many of you know when it's time to pray with somebody to accept Jesus Christ? Timing is everything. I've been on an airplane where um, I remember one day I was flying back from South Africa and I was alone and I was sitting on an airplane next, next to this lady and so well kept well-groomed, she was a corporate executive, and we just started to talk. And then she had just discovered that her husband was filing for divorce. And by the way, she made the money. She had a prenup. It wasn't about money. And there we are on the plane, and she was just drinking the whole time, and she's weeping and weeping and weeping and weeping. And I said, Do you know what? I know this is gonna sound presumptuous. This was timing. Timing is everything. I think I know somebody who can help you, but I'm afraid you're gonna laugh at me. You're gonna think I'm uneducated. You're gonna think I'm ignorant. And she looked at me, I'll never forget this. Try me. I said, Jesus can help you. And she looked at me, and I won't use her language, but my life is so screwed up I am so broken, she says, if you told me a snail could help me right now, I'd be interested. I would be open. I just want you to prove the position. Timing is everything. But here it is. The series we're embarking on over these next couple of months is all about knowing the times. Friends, knowing the times, it's a matter of life and death. And I'm going to argue that in the church, there are times we don't know the times. We don't know where our kids are at. We don't know what's happening to our marriages. We just don't have a sense of the opportunities, the open door that the Lord has laid before us. At times we're so caught up doing church the same old way and enjoying it and it's wonderful and it's great, but we miss the day of visitation. We miss the opportunity. We miss the reason that Jesus wept over the nation of Israel, his own people. Knowing the times isn't just a matter of life and death. I'd like to go a little bit further. It's a matter of eternal life. 
You know, it was the craziest thing. On March 14th, 1977, when I got saved, it was so inconvenient. I'm in law school. My whole life was mapped out for me. How many of you ever had your life all mapped out for you and then something changes, something happens and you're broken, you're hurting, you're wounded and you don't realize this is a God thing. This is your God opportunity, but it's uncomfortable. But God is more interested in the development of your character than the provision of your comfort. But knowing the times is a matter of eternal life. Listen to how God puts it in Galatians 4.4. 4. But when the time had fully come, and this is the picture of a woman about to give birth. God sent his son, born of a woman, born under law. Jesus did not come. The Father did not send Jesus to die for our sins in the Garden of Eden. How many of you know for our own kids, man, we'd all want to do that. We'd want to send Jesus immediately. But he waited for something strategic to happen. He waited for all of the roads on the, on the known, throughout the known earth at the time to connect. There was a merchant's highway. Israel was interfaced. There was a common merchant language. There was perfect timing to bring forth the gospel to maximize its impact and effectiveness of the most people, many as possible, getting saved. It says here that knowing the times is really a matter of not missing your destiny. Come here, come here a second. Do you still have a destiny? Frank, I mean, you've been diagnosed with MS and you've had struggles that many cannot understand. But do you still believe you have a destiny? Eddie, Maria, this isn't your first rodeo. But do you believe, come on now, you, I mean, Eddie's getting old, Maria's getting young, but I gotta ask you, uh, do you really believe you still have a destiny? Yes, I do. Uh, okay, Maria, how about you, you agree? Yeah, you do. Rick, Linda, you've been serving the Lord for a long, long time. You've raised a very godly daughter, and Chris wants to say thank you right now. Okay, but uh, I, I'm curious. Even at your old age of 40-something, do you two still believe that you have a destiny? Rick, do you really believe that? Rick, don't get so excited. I mean, really. Would somebody take Rick's pulse? I want to make sure he's still alive now. Come on now. I know, man. Rick, you, th this guy cracks me up. He's, he's been doing this, we've been kind of hanging out a little bit. And he's got a great sense of humor, man. I love your sense of humor. It is, it catches me by surprise at times. It says in Luke 19, verse 43 to 44, look at this. When it talks about your destiny. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you, surround you and close you in on every side and level you and your children within you to the ground and they will not leave in you. He's talking to the Jews right now. One stone upon another, 70 AD, when the temple, the second temple was destroyed because you did not know the time of your visitation. If you're a father today and you still have children in the home, raise your hand. Raise your hand. Any, any mothers here still have kids in the home right now? Any grandparents that are helping to co-parent the children or you're involved and what have you? Do you realize that if we miss our day of visitation... If we miss what the Lord is up to, if we do not know the signs of the times, if we do not know what the Lord is up to, our children and our grandchildren and generations to come, they can miss their day of visitation as well. So I want to ask you a question. I want you to think about this. Because I'm a church guy. I'm a church guy. I'm not the church lady from Saturday Night Live, but I am a church guy. And... I, 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 want you to, I want to ask you a question. I want you to think about it. We'll take a vote. Do you believe the church overall, worldwide, knows the times we're living in right now? Friends, some of us are so freaked out about social media, and yet it's one of the most impactful and effective ways to reach people with the gospel. 
Some of us are so overwhelmed by different styles and different ways and different opportunities and how we can reach people for Jesus Christ. But I'm going to argue that historically, the Protestant church, and the word Protestant means protestant. They protested Catholicism. And there's some great Catholic folks out there. But uh, there used to be a saying about the Catholic church. The Catholic church moves in three speeds. Slow, slower, and slowest. It takes a long time to bring forth change there. And, and they'll tell you that. I've done some work with the Catholic church. I know that. But friends, we're no different in the Protestant or in the Protestant church as well. There are times that we really don't understand the times we're living in. Friends, we had an opportunity to grab hold of the airwaves. It was the church that was given one of the first opportunities to propagate the gospel, and we said, that's the devil's tool. That's, that's, that, that's a device of the devil, and we wanted nothing to do with it. But guess what? Oral Roberts made the decision that he was going to make a difference. He grabbed hold of the airwaves. Somebody else by the name of Catherine Kuhlman grabbed hold of the airwaves. And you can say, I disagree, and I'm not going there right now. Also, there was someone else, you probably never heard of Amy Simple. Oh, maybe you have. There's a gal in the Bible, and sometimes in the church, we better be careful what our view is on women being used of God. Her name was Esther. That was the Gentile name. Who remembers what her Hebrew name was? Who said that? Yell it. Hadassah. Hadassah. That's right. And it's a name that actually speaks of a woman of the covenant. It speaks of a woman of the covenant. She knew the times. In fact, between her and her uncle Mordechai, something first cousin, we can have a debate on that till the cows come home, but not the pigs. But anyway, guess what? She knew the times, and her uncle knew the times they were living in, because there was going to be a mass genocide. An evil man by the name of Haman got an edict of the law of the Medes and the Persians to kill every Jew. This goes back to terrorism in the, well, the known world at the time. And finally, Esther and Mordechai had a conversation. And he says, if you do not help your own people out, because she was flying under the radar. She married a guy and didn't even tell King Ahasuerus, her husband, that she was a Jewess. And he says, listen, if you do not intercede for your people, somebody else will. But he says, but then we're going to miss the blessing. We're going to be cut off. Our lineage will be cut off. And he says, and perhaps the Lord has called you to the kingdom for such a time as this. For such a time as this. How many of you know when you come to know Jesus as Lord and Savior, whether today was the first time, or whether, like my wife Marge, many, many, many years ago, you have to ask yourself, have you been called to the kingdom for such a time as this? How many of you have at least one child that you're raising or have raised that is definitely what you call a child of the cross that makes you more like Jesus. In fact, every time you look at that child, you go, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Or you look at your kid, forgive him, for he doesn't know what he's doing. And we've been through some difficult seasons, and you can relate to this. But do you know the times? Do you know the season? When you send your child to school, and I'm not anti-public school, that's not the point today. But do we really know? What are they learning? Who are they learning from? Friends, when we have different people babysit them, when we have other people watch them, do we know the times? Do we know the seasons? But think of Esther. Here is this young, beautiful woman, and she's got it all, man. She's married to the Bill Gates of her day. She, she, she's got, I mean, unparalleled wealth. But she realizes she stands for the Jews if she comes out of the proverbial closet of Judaism and says, I'm a Jewess. If you kill them, you have to kill me. She's saying, but you know what? I think maybe I've been put in this position for such a time as this. In scripture, as we learn a little bit about terrorism, we have what's called 
Kairos moments. You've heard me say that before. If you have a watch or an Apple watch or if your cell phone is your watch, come on now, then that's called chronos. You've got chronos time. That means you know literally what time it is. But a Kairos moment, have you ever noticed there's a lot of news stations called what? Cairo TV. And it talks about a moment, it's a different kind of time, that defines every other moment. Empowered people know the Kairos. They know the strategic times. We'll never really be able to respond to the current and past attacks on our nation, on the nation of Israel, worldwide, unless we understand from a biblical perspective what the times we're living in are all about. Do you get the times? Do you realize, why is it? I, I'm pro maybe, uh, how many of you are the first Jewish individual you've ever really known? Raise your hand. Okay. How many of you have known a lot of Jewish people? Maybe you've had some different perspectives and different insights, and you wonder, what is the big difference? I would like to argue all of you have intimately known a Jew. His name is Jesus. Do you know, I have actually, I'll talk to somebody, I'll say, I've never known a Jew. You're the first Jew I've ever met. And I'll say, well, you know, Jesus was Jewish. Really? Really? I actually had a debate with somebody, and they said, Jesus, um, he's black. He was black. The other person, no, he was white. I said, oh, really? He was white, black, white. I said, he's Jewish. And they laugh at me. Like, where did you come up with that idea? You see, friends, here it is. We're going to find that there is nothing that's happening in our world today that does not have footing or a root system or history in the scriptures. Friends, when bin Laden happened, it's right in the scriptures. When Saddam Hussein happened, it's right there in the scriptures. When Nebuchadnezzar happened, it's right there in the scriptures. When Xerxes happened, it's right there in the scriptures. Don't worry if you know these names or not, but when you look at the Canaanites and the Amalekites and the Jebusites and the Hittites and all the other Yagamaga Igaites, they're in the scripture. Who are they? Where do they come from? Timing really is everything. There was a Japanese soldier by the name of Sohochi Yokaya. Sohochi Yokaya. Hope you're taking notes. There'll be a test on this later. He lived in an island. Maybe you heard about this. He lived on an island in a cave on Guam, on, on Guam to which he fled in 1944 when the tides of war began to change and the Japanese who were winning were now losing. Fearing for his life, he stayed hidden for 28 years from 1944, moving forward, in the jungle cave, and he would only come out at night. How many of us are still living in a jungle cave in fear, in confusion? We don't know the times, and we're missing our day of visitation our opportunity. During the self-imposed exile, he lived, here's, listen to his diet, you're gonna love it, man. It's gourmet. Frogs, rats, snails, shrimp, nuts, and mangoes. Even when he figured out the war was over, he was afraid to come out now for fear that the Japanese would execute him for desertion, even though he thought that he was staying the course and that the war was still going on. Two hunters found him one day and said, dude, World War II's over. World War II has been over for years, and they escorted him to freedom. He was living all this time under the consequences of World War II, not knowing that he was now a free man. How many of you know whom the Son sets free? He's what? Free indeed. Here it is the liberty where Christ has set you free. You see, friends, you are free, but how many of us are still living in bondage? How many of us are still living, not realizing that the Lord himself has proclaimed on the cross our emancipation proclamation? How many of us still live in the 
bondage of our sins, not realizing that Jesus Christ paid it all. Jesus Christ has already shed his blood for us. He already has atoned for every sin you've ever done that you are doing or ever will do if you come into relationship with him. The only thing that changed Yochiah from an enemy to an ally was timing. Because the hunters who found him in 1944 would have been his enemies. Now they were his liberators. Isn't it amazing? In 1944 to 1945, we were preparing to bomb two of the major uh, commercial cities of Japan. Then afterwards, we started buying all of our automobiles from Japan. And all of a sudden, they became a very prosperous nation. People that know the times are influencers. And how many of you understand, in order for us to understand terrorism, in order for us to understand what's happening in our culture, we have to know the times. We have to know what's going on. And you're about to listen and hear about the longest lasting family feud in the history of the human race. How many of you have any family members that do not get along? How many of you know, how many, we all have that uncle that we do not want to have come over for Thanksgiving. Come on, how many of you know that uncle? How many of you are sitting next to that uncle right now? No, 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 here it is. Okay, First Chronicles 12, 32. The men of Issachar, I keep talking about this. This is a tribe of Israel. The men of Issachar who understood the times and knew what Israel should do. Now notice this, there were 200 chiefs or leaders with all their relatives under their command. The sons of Issachar, they came to David and when he was preparing for a great battle. Now there was a great army being amassed to team with David at a city called, well I say Hebron, you probably say Hebron. If you read about all the leaders and soldiers that came from each tribe, listen to this, to team with David, there were thousands of them getting ready for this battle. What does this have to do with terrorism? Don't miss it. But there were only 200 men, everyone say 200. 200 men from the sons of Issachar and their relatives were under their command. They're on the same page. They're moving in the same direction. This is a very, very, very small tribe. Now the other tribes, I want to mention this to you, there was one tribe that had 6,800 leaders. How many did Issachar have? 200. Another one had 7,100. Another one had 20,800. Another one had 18,000. There was another that had 50,000. Another had 40,000. There was another that had 120,000 leaders. Here you only have 200 leaders who knew the times. They knew what was going on. They knew who was for them and who was against them. Who was their enemy and who was their ally. And they knew specifically what to do. Now watch this. If you study it historically, the sons of Issachar energized the army of King David. How many of you, there's somebody in your life that you know when you get together with them, they energize you? Man, they, they literally create cadence with your passion. They increase your passion. They increase your vision. There's something about them. So listen to these guys now. Here's how they energize the armies of David. Number one, they knew the times. Everyone say, knew the times. They knew what to do in view of the times. How many of you here really have a sense the times are growing evil? There's some difficult things happening, but do you really know the day we're living in? Do you really know the times we're living in? It's not enough to just say, oh, it's bad, it couldn't be worse, but here is the key. They knew what to do in view of the times. They would have been the guys on September 10th, 2001, buying gold. They would have been the individuals who would have been early adopters, if you will, buying their Microsoft and everything else. And that's not what this is about, but just understand this. These leaders were skilled in reading the times properly. How many of you think it's important as leaders that we know the times? How many of you for our children it's important you know the times? They understood, here's the key word, they understood the times. How many of you have ever looked at this world and you go, I don't know what's going on. 
I don't know what's happening. I mean, how many of you ever looked at some of our politicians and the decisions they make, and you're thinking, how dumb can you get and still breathe? How many of you have ever looked and said, man, I've listened to people. Oh, man, I want to get out of California. How many of you know, man, California or Hemet is the hotel California. You can check out any time you want, but you can never leave, you know? That's how some of us seem to feel, okay? And I go, oh, if I could move to Arizona, if I could move to Utah. And I'm going, well, wait a minute. Do you know the times in Arizona better? Do you know the times in Utah better? Do we really know what God is up to? They knew that what pathway Israel should take. They knew that Israel had to take action. But listen, more importantly, they knew the action that Israel should take. How many of you have ever known with one of your kids or grandkids or in your marriage or the guy you're dating or the gal you're dating, you knew you had to take some action? How many of you have ever been there? You knew you had to take some action. You just wish you knew, but what's the action? What exactly should I do? There's times I need a different job. This job isn't working out. There are times, friends, I'm going to be a forthright. We go from church, church, to church. How many of you remember this song? Do, 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 Church hop, church. And we go from one church to another. What's up, doc? And we're constantly thinking, it'll be better over here. But I listen to some people. Man, some people have gone to so many churches, it's kind of like a wine tasting thing. You know what I'm going? It's like, man, they are drunk on churches. They're going from this church and this church and this church and this church and this church, and they can tell me everything wrong with every church in the valley. But it's not enough to know that maybe you need something different, but it's when you know exactly what you need and what you need to do. For years I've met many people that know that they don't like what we're doing, but they don't exactly know what we should be doing. Do we really know the times we're living in and how we can reach a nine-year-old? Do we really know the times and how we can be blessed. There's a reason. I'm going to blow you away. If you're over 30 years of age, raise your hand. Raise your hand. Raise your hand. Over 30. How old are you? You're 30? If you are over 30, are you more than 30 in one day? Yeah. I'll make it 30 or over. Okay. You got it there? You're old. You are older than dirt. In fact, you are older than a nine-year-old. It's all relative. Do you know there's a reason why the Lord keeps us on this planet? Because remember, man, we used to sing the song, heaven is a wonderful place, remembers that, filled with glory and grace. I want to see my Savior's face. Heaven is a wonderful place. I want to go there. Heaven, wonderful place, filled with, yeah, then why don't we just go there? Let's go there now. We're here for a reason. But do we know that reason? We're so afraid, what if the music gets a little bit louder? What if it gets a little more hip? Friends, can I be up front with you? If I thought I could come up here and win 50 people to Christ with a rap song in worship, I'd be saying, let's rap. Oh, pastor, that's evil. That's terrible. Please understand, some of us have physical conditions and issues, and it's okay to prefer different types and styles and forms of worship. But I, I just need to ask you, what does this have to do with terrorism? Well, I'm here to terrorize you today. No, that's not what it is. How many of you, your child having a great life in Jesus and a great eternity in Jesus and your grandkids, it's a priority. Raise your hand. Really? So what's your strategy? What's your vision? What's the plan? It's easy to not like some of the things that I might do but this isn't my first rodeo either, so let's, let's talk about it. Here it is. When you know Israel has to take action, but more importantly, you know what that action is. That's the game changer. They knew the way Israel should take action, if you will. It's not just like all of a sudden 9-11 happens, and oh, we'll get there, and what should we do? Let's just go bomb Afghanistan. I'm not here to get political today. 
And you can say, Pastor, that was a great strategy. We had to do something. I'm not here to agree or disagree with anyone, but how many of you know once America officially exits Afghanistan, it will go back to, it's historical, friends. Look what it did to the Russians, look what's happened. You, there was never a strategy, it was a statement. And I respect our president. I believe genuinely George W. Bush was a born again Christian. I genuinely believe in his heart of hearts, he wanted to do all that he knew to do. But we have to ask this question, we then go into Iraq. And we're gonna be looking at this as we look at the Persians, as we look at the, uh, which are the Iranians, and as we look at the Babylonians, which is going to Iraq, and we're gonna start asking some questions. Did America really know the times? Isn't it great since we went into, since we went into Afghanistan and since we went into Iraq, how the nation, they've all come to Jesus? Terrorism is over. It is finished, the battle is over. Is it really? Now listen to me, how should we do things? What's our long-term strategy? Just be upfront with me. Is terrorism really a problem? Is ter how many of you think it's a problem? If you don't, you ain't seen nothing yet. You ain't seen nothing yet. Friends, we are living, just go back to the green line in Ireland. Look at the Catholics and the Protestants and what has taken place through the years, another form of terrorism. How should we do things? Bear Bryant, who remembers Coach Bear Bryant of Alabama? Did you know that on Alabama, if you were African American, you could not get a scholarship there? You couldn't play. But a guy named John McKay at USC, he said, I just noticed something. Run, Forrest, run! Some of these folks can run, and some of these folks can play, and all of a sudden, California, the liberal state, decided, we're going to let black people play football too. What a great idea. They still won't let Jews play. I remember I told you guys in college I was a tailback on the football team, and every time I got off the bench, the coach said, you get your tail back on the bench. But I mean, that just isn't my gift, if you will, not my talent. But here's what Bear Bryant said, and he was a great coach, and he changed. We all have an opinion after the fact. We all have an opinion after the fact. So let's just bring this together for a foundation today, if we possibly could. The 200 sons of Issachar knew the right course for each occasion they encountered. So here's what I want you to write down. Spiritual understanding with a touch of the prophetic is the key to good judgment. Imagine if we really had spiritual understanding when it comes to our children. Imagine if we could really look to the future and really the prophetic is foretelling and foretelling. Foretelling we can see what's happening in the future and foretelling is we really receive a word from God as to what we should do, how might things change. How many of you thought, wish you could be, how many ladies here wish you could be a prophetess if you're single today? before you say, I do, to a guy. You know what he's gonna do, what he's gonna be like, how he's gonna treat you, whether he's gonna be faithful or not. How many of you would say that would be so cool? Wouldn't that be so cool? Wouldn't that be so cool? How many of you know there's a lot of people, and if you're married today, you've gotta to act really uninvolved for a moment. Don't look at your mate, they'll get paranoid, it gets ugly, then they call me, and oh man, it's terrible. How many of you know a lot of us we were not like the sons of Issachar. We did not inquire of the Lord. It's like somebody wants to marry us and we're desperate. Or we figure nothing better is going to come along. Or we just get ourselves in a situation, but we don't know the times. Watch this, watch this, watch this. This is key. Men or women of prophetic understanding make a distinction between, between options. You have to see this. Before I talk about Islam and all these things, this foundation is key. Ecclesiastes 3, verse 1 through 8. There is a time for everything. 
Isn't that great? And a season for every activity under heaven. A time to be born and a time to die. Friends, children like Abishai in the church and Levi, you got Lincoln, I think they're all about two years of age. You take that group right there. These are priorities to me. There's a time to be born. There's a time for their day in the sun. There's a day for their opportunity. And the Lord gives us different generations that we might be impactful. If you're an, old, if you're an older woman, and let me explain an older woman. If a 20-year-old girl gets married today and you're 30 years old, you are an older woman. And the Bible actually says older women are supposed to teach younger women how to love their husbands. The Bible actually teaches that we men are actually to learn from our fathers and spiritual fathers how to reverence our wives, how to treat them like royalty, how to provide for them, how to encourage the gift that is in them. There's a lot that we have to understand. There's a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to uproot, a time to kill, but there's also a time to heal. If you don't know the right time, we're in trouble. A time to tear down and a time to build. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. I like that. A time to scatter stones and a time to gather them. A time to embrace and a time to refrain. Timing is everything, friends. Can I blow your mind? Ladies, some of you are going to get so mad at me right now. I'm, would you mind if I preach this way for just a moment? God can heal anything that's ever happened. But you know when women wanted equal rights? And I do believe in equal pay. I believe some of God's best men are women, and that's not meant to be a joke. That's meant to say, when I look at churches today, we'd be dead without the quality women that we have. When I look at corporate America, I actually prefer a lot of the female CEOs to a lot of the male CEOs that I've worked with. They multitask better, they tend to have a lot more compassion, and there's some men that are phenomenal as well. But friends, we often make this mistake. We make this mistake. We miss the timing. Did you know there is a time for sexual intimacy, and it's in marriage? Now, ladies, men and women think differently than each other. Marge, would you join me here? I know you're very nervous since I brought up sexual intimacy, but Marge, would you please join me up here? It's good to see you, the mother of my five children, and actually, we have them together. I always love it. Whenever we're there, she pats me on the back. Okay, burp me. There. Okay, we got it. There we go. <laughs> and now she's tickling me. Okay, women are motivated by touch. We'll talk about this at young couples. And also the sound of a voice. That's why so many women are deceived. They think a man looks at intimacy the same way that they look at intimacy. A man is motivated by drooling. No? Hey, baby. Anyway, a man is motivated by eyesight. What he sees, what he sees, touch, the sound of a voice. And many a man is able to manipulate and convince a woman, I'll love you in the morning after I've taken your virginity. And before you put the man down, this goes both ways. Friends, I'm not here to say you, everything is allowable, the Bible says, just not everything is profitable. And we're living in a culture today where very few men, because they're so bound by pornography, we're talking about more than 50% if you want to look at the stats from Dr. James Dobson, and they're so wanting to have that physiological release without commitment, without providing security, without realizing after 40 years, as Jim Carrey would say, and it's a blessing. It is a good thing, isn't it? Oh, you're turning me off, man. He, Steve, come on now. No, anyway, he who finds a good wife obtains favor from the Lord. It says, who can find a good wife? You have found a good thing. This is my thing. 
um, her thing. But there's something that we're really missing. I'm not here to be a prude. I'm not here to be old-fashioned. I'm here to say, when the Lord spoke of virginity, and I believe in the res restoration of virginity, it's important we realize many a man, when all of a sudden he's able to be intimate with a woman prior to marriage, he never looks at her the same. You can say he does, and I'm here to tell you after 40 years of doing this, I'm here to tell you after what Jehovah says, what the word of God says, it's not true until there's repentance, until we ask forgiveness. Now, Elder Bob, does this sound biblical? This, I mean, guys, how many of you, this does sound biblical? It, how many of you ladies, you're going, well, we have our rights. You're right, you can do whatever you want to do. God even lets you go to hell, you know? And some were things, babe, we miss the point. There is a time, but do our children understand timing? How many of our children, their lives are going to be terrorized? And before we start putting the men down, there's a lot of women out there, and they still figure, they, they, there's a lack of understanding what covenant is, what it means to move forward together. Let me finish with these thoughts today. There is a time to search and a time to give up, a time to keep and a time to throw away. That doesn't mean your spouse. A time to tear and a time to mend, a time to be silent and a time to speak. Here it is. There's even a time to love and a time to hate. Even God hated. The Bible says, Jacob I have loved. We'll talk about this later. Esau I have hated. A time for war and a time for peace. Men and women of knowledge understand what time they are in. So when I bring up Islam in this series, friends, when I bring up the prophet Muhammad, when I share some things, it's going to be so outlandish to some of your minds. We live in a culture where we must be tolerant of everybody. We live in a culture where something can absolutely be demonic. If, how many of you agree if somebody's book, their Bible, says kill all Christians, how many of you aren't so sure you want to have them over for Christmas dinner? But it's right there. And yet we say, oh, not all Muslims think that way. It's true. Ignorant ones do not because they don't know the Koran. They don't know what it says. But it is still the belief system. Well, pastor, you're a Jew. Naturally, you just don't like Muslims. Friends, I support ministries out of my own pocket to reach the Muslims because every soul is important to God. The Lord loves black, white, red, yellow, brown, and olive skin. He loves male and female. He loves Jew and Gentile, free men and bond. He loves everyone as far as he wouldn't that any should perish. So men of knowledge, I finish with these thoughts, understand which season we're in. Is it a time of peace or a time of war? We have a question to ask. A time to live or a time to die? Is it a time for revival right here in this church, or is it a time for mobilization beyond these doors, or is it both? Is it, is, is it a time to build or a time to reinforce, a time to preach end times, or a time to teach a marriage seminar? There are things you tell a child that make no sense. At 18, all of a sudden, they are words of a genius. How many of you... When you were a teenager, there were things your parents told you and you thought they were the dumbest people in the world. How many of you, when you became a young adult, all of a sudden, they, the same words sounded like sagacity, sage, brilliant, if you will. We may preach an end time series, but not know what to do about the end times we're living in. We've got these weird conferences, friends, and everyone wants to learn about the end times. Pastor, preach on the book of Revelation. I can do that. Pastor, preach on Daniel. I can do that. Pastor, especially the last 11 chapters of Isaiah, I can do that. Pastor, I want to understand the valley of dead bones. Pa we can do this. But what do you do with it? Now that you know these things, what will you do? do with it. We are the most educated society in America today of all times. Not in the world, but for America. We have more teaching on marriage in the church than ever before, and we have the highest divorce rate we have ever had in the church. Our divorce rate is about the same as people who do not know Jesus. Now, please don't freak out, guys. I don't care where you've been. Let's all draw a line. 
Because sin is sin no matter who you are. And I'm not here to say what your circumstances were or what your reason is. But how many of you say it's kind of interesting. We have more teachings on marriage today than we've ever had before. But more divorces. Now, here it is. Great biblical teaching. And I mean, and it's amazing. And we have the least involvement as far as serving in our churches today. We have great teaching on motivation and self-esteem, and yet in America today, we have the highest level of depression we've ever had. How many of you know right now, right now, we are prescribing more antidepressants than we ever have in our entire history as a nation, number one. Now, here's an interesting one. The state of Utah, where everyone's so nice. They actually dispense the highest levels of Zoloft, Paxil, Abilify. And I'm not saying if you're on antidepressant medication, that's a bad thing. That's not my point, if you will. We have the best seminars on evangelism. Man, we've got books like Contagious Christianity, The Master Plan of Evangelism, Kennedy's Evangelism Explosion. We've got all these things. And yet the majority of Christians and churches today do not share their faith. Here's my point, Not, no condemnation. No condemnation. But as we start to talk about Islam, as we talk about terrorism, as we talk about the end times, just because we're knowledgeable, what do we do with it? Timing, interesting, it's kind of interesting, is everything. One of the things a Jewish boy learns at a very young age, and I'm just going to take about six or seven more minutes and we're going to, Put, put a fork in this thing. One of the first things you learn beginning at age five as a young man is you learn the cycle. We'll be talking about this with the young couples of your wife, her cycle. The Bible says husbands live with your wife according to knowledge. And even after menopause or for a man, andropause, it doesn't mean that cycle ever stops in how she hormonally actually works. When you look at a woman in her chemical laboratory with estrogen, progesterone, DHEA, and even for a woman, testosterone, it has a great impact. But if you will look at a woman and understand that the first week after she menstruates is called the spring. The second week when she ovulates is called the summer when she feels good and life can be great in your home. But the third week comes the fall. What a lot of men do not realize, the worst week for a woman, oh, he understands. No, I don't. I'm like Stevie Wonder explaining the color pink right now. But um, here it is. It's that third week when the fall takes place. By the way, more women commit suicide, or be careful, guys, homicide, during that third week of their cycle than any other time, according to a German study. But in that third week, timing is everything. That's when women feel itchy and witchy and bloated and icky and all this stuff. And I do a series called, Does My Wife Really Need Chocolate? There's lots of <laughs> iron in the chocolate. And men, that third week, you know, it's like you could talk to your wife the second week when she feels good and she ovulates and it's the way God made her. And you know, honey, it really bothers me when you make that casserole and I really don't like it. Oh, it's okay. I love you. I love you. It's wonderful. Then the third week, you idiot! Who killed my sister? I'm gonna kill you and your little dog Toto. I mean, life is a little different the third week. You're going, but on the second week, you said, I got you, babe. And over here, you're just looking at me going, do the stomp. I mean, it's a whole different thing. But you see, it's understanding timing. Ladies, if you can understand the timing of the hormonal makeup of a man, it's in Leviticus. It's in Deuteronomy. Did you know that men actually, how many of you, when your husband comes home, he basically is death sucking on a lifesaver? And you say, honey, how was you, you know, what are you thinking about? Nothing. He's really telling the truth. His testosterone, which isn't just about sex, it's about his thoughts. It's about his motivation. It's like it's at the lowest. But the good news, ladies, is at 2 a.m. That's when a man's testosterone is at its highest. 
So what it basically says is when we're at our best, we're worthless. Okay, anyway, because we're sleeping, okay? Now, you shouldn't bring this up in church. You're right. Just because Jesus does, why should I? Listen now. The sons of Issachar had understood. You better play some music real quick, and it better be forgiveness music and healing music. And <laughs> The sons of Issachar, they had understanding. They knew what to do, and they're going to help us with terrorism. Some of you are saying, my wife's a terrorist that third week. Well, dude, they, women have that weird week. They do. But did you know, men, we cycle daily. You think women are complicated? You think women are complicated? I would never marry me. <laughs> or you, Ron. You're not my type. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Those of you watching out there in La La Land. I promise you this is really not an alcoholic beverage. This is tea, if you want to look at it. <laughs> Terry, I'm glad I could provide a little entertainment for your soul today. This is why I'm not just going to give you prophetic facts today on what's happening in the world. Will you, how many of you remember reading the second best-selling book of all times, which is now number seven, I believe? the late great planet Earth, Hal Lindsey. Don't get me wrong. I'm not here to get down on Hal Lindsey. But how many of you know prophetically the book was worthless? It was totally comic book eschatology or end times thoughts. And, but I got saved through that book. How many of you know, friends, you can get saved getting hit on the, get, putting your head in a cement mixture. That's not the point. That doesn't mean it's healthy. That doesn't mean it's good. I never said that before. I don't know where that came from. I want to first lay a context of understanding so that we'll be able to apply this understanding with wisdom. It's too hard, and life is too short to spend your time doing something because someone else has said it's important. you got to feel the thing for yourself. Friends, right now, people can so easily say, Pastor, are you anti-Jordanians? and Lebanese, and Arabs, not even a little. I've got a lot of great friends from that background. There's something we need to understand about Islam that's affecting America today. It's affecting London today. In prophetic times, good judgment is essential. Now, I wish I could, you know, it's amazing sometimes what I think I could really get done in one little session. But what I want you to do because we're going to get into the Great Depression, a lot of stuff. How many of you, though I didn't get very far today, though you think I got super far, far, okay, but how many of you are getting something out of this? How many of you are understanding? It's important we know the times we live in. If you'll give me the grace to just say one other thing, this is going to help me. In prophetic times, good judgment is essential. This is not the time for prophesying the obvious. How many of you grew up in a charismatic church where there were prophecies every Sunday in the church? How many of you grew up there? And how many of you remember some of the prophecies? My children, my children, I love you. Tell me something I don't know. My children, praise me, glorify me. Or my children, I'll be coming back someday. We literally, you remember back at uh, Home Full Gospel Church, we were in a service and the lady was mad at the church. And she got up and said, the Lord is upset with you. I think I told you this before. He is ticked at this church. And I'm on the platform going, this ought to be interesting. He is so upset, he is writing Michelob on the walls of this church. Michelob? I said, babe, isn't that a beer? She said, I don't know. She didn't. He meant to, she meant to say Ichabod. You know, the glory of God has departed, but she put down Michelob. It just kind of blew my mind. Or, is, friends, there's times people get up, my children, I am upset with America. America is in sin. Duh. It's not a prophecy, friends. This is the end times we're living in. How many of you believe that? Do you know when the end times began, by the way, biblically? 
2,000 years ago. That's when everything shifted when Jesus died on the cross and was resurrected from the dead. The sons of Issachar had practical, God-breathed insight. They knew exactly what David had to do in order to return to the throne. When David was betrayed by the people that were closest to him, it wasn't the 21,000 leaders. It wasn't the 120,000 leaders. It wasn't the 17,000 leaders. It was these 200 guys that said, David, we've got a word from God, and this is what you need to do. I'm saying even in the church, we're missing what the Lord is telling us. I mean, these guys here, they organized a food program just like Joseph did, and they had understanding. They put transportation together. They even told David what tribes of Israel they could trust and which ones they couldn't. This was the tribe that knew what Israel should do. They knew how to apply the prophetic to real life, to real people. Do you know America would be a better place if leaders would do more long-term thinking? Do you know the times and the season that your family is in right now? Do you know the times and seasons that you're in right now? You know, it's kind of an Iroquois society. Leaders are encouraged to remember seven generations in the past and then consider seven generations moving forward into the future when making decisions that will affect people, that will affect generations. I want to ask you, if you're a parent today, do your decisions, are you thinking about your grandkids right now? Are you thinking about your great-grandkids right now? Are you thinking about the decisions you make and how it's going to impact things in the future? Friends, we have to stop prophesying the obvious of this generation. A lot of our kids, you know, here's how we prophesy. I'm very disappointed in you, son. WWJD, which is? And the kid's going, I don't know. Do you know what Jesus really would do? We need words that help people in the midst of the war. How many of you know America had every way of knowing, in fact, there are many key people in America who knew that the World Trade Center had already been threatened. They already tried to take it down in 1993. But friends, there was a lack of judgment and a lack of leadership as to what do we do. People do not need your prophetic insight as to when the tribulation begins or who the antichrist is guess what it's kind of interesting people need jesus so next next week we're really going to take off on this series i really had a lot more how many of you know i have a lot more always i want to say but how many of you here really believe really believe that we are living in unique times right now. But weren't they unique during the Reformation? Weren't they unique during the Middle Ages? Aren't the times unique in Israel when they became a nation back in what year? 1948, very good. Friends, knowing the times, knowing the season. Do you realize how Israel became a nation and how impossible it was? How many of you have ever heard of the Belfort Agreement? Just some thoughts to think about. We're living, though, in unprecedented, special times. And I still have to give you the foundation. And if we had five more hours, how many of you know when, how many of you ever been to a prophetic conference? And how many of you know sometimes they'll go four or five hours and they'll give you all this stuff? We're not gonna do that. Everyone look at your neighbor and say, thank you, Jesus. Drop, kick me, Jesus, okay. But I want you to think of this. And this is what I want you to go home with. In the Hebrew, the word times equals, you can put this in your notes and I'm gonna start here knowing the purpose of actions in the context of a time frame. Knowing the purpose of actions in the context of a time frame. Friends, if you ever bid on a house, how many of you own a house? Anyone own a house here? How many of you would say there's better times to buy a house than there's worse times to buy a house? There's times when the market just kind of skyrockets. It's knowing what to do, but knowing when to to do it. And as we look at this, I'm going to show you something as we talk about Islam. And hell, I'm going to to compare it to what's happening in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and in your city, in London, England. And we're going to take a look at how, if we do not know the times, we literally can enter what's called a post-Christian era. We can help our kids grow up in an environment with complete confusion 
and they don't even realize the significance of who Jesus Christ is. A lot of our kids, they're missing Jesus because friends, we just didn't know the times. We didn't know the seasons. And here's the good news. Am I the only one here who's ever missed Jesus? How many of you ever missed Jesus? How many of you ever made a bad decision? How many of you ever wish you could have known the times? You could have known the seasons. You could have understood what was taking place. Well, we'll pick up on that next time. Well, this isn't a real altar call kind of ending, so let's close with a word of prayer. Father, in Jesus' name, help us to know the times. Help us to know the season. Help us to know where we're living, what we're doing, and why you've strategically placed us where you've placed us. Lord, we need a God word, even with our own children. Lord, we cannot treat an 11-year-old child like they're a 3-year-old child. We have to know the time. We have to know the season. Lord God, we have to know the timing and season that each of our boys and each of our girls are in, even here in this church. Lord, even as we bring forth the word with boldness, we have to realize how easily we can get caught up in false doctrines and every wind of doctrine, and and we can compromise your word because we do not know the times. We do not know the season. And so, Lord, I'm asking you tonight, help us. Help me as we rightly divide the word of truth to realize we are not haters, we are lovers. We are not here to walk with an adversarial attitude towards enemies of the gospel because, Lord, you said you have given us, even pagans, even heathen as our inheritance, not to kill, not to destroy, but to bring into the kingdom. Help us, Lord, to realize that we can speak truth even when people are living in a lie without being mean-spirited and hateful and condescending and condemning and judgmental. Lord, would you just help the scales to fall from our eyes and help us not to try to join the spirit of our state by being politically correct, but help us to be biblically correct with integrity, with character, and with charity, above all else, love. In the name of Jesus, and everybody said? Amen. Amen. Friends, please do not miss this next week because we're going to dig a lot deeper. How many of you are open to it? Everyone say amen. 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 God bless you. And I want to see our visitors before you go. I got the doors already blocked.